Ladies and gentlemen, very welcome to CIEPS, the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies, and today's webinar, what are the powers of the rotating presidency and what can we expect from France's presidency? My name is Joram von Sydow and I'm the director of uh, this institute, and I'm really happy to welcome you to join in in this discussion. We are currently living in uh, quite difficult times with the security situation that is worry worrying. And the European Union, of course, is affected by all of this. In the European Union, uh, there is an important role for the rotating presidency of the Council. For Sweden, it's only about 11 months away when it's time for Sweden to again pick up this six months period of responsibility. But already now, Sweden actually plays a part in this uh, presidency, as we are also part of the so-called trio. The three uh, presidencies working together in an 18 months period to guide the European Union forward. France took over this presidency at the beginning of this year, so only a month ago. And we know that there is an important role for France in the European Union, but also that domestic politics are also very interesting to follow as we have presidential elections that fall right into this uh, presidency period. But the role of the rotating presidency has changed slightly since last time that these two countries, Sweden and France, uh, had this responsibility. You may remember that the last time Sweden had the rotating presidency was actually the last of the traditional role, presidency role as the Lisbon Treaty entered into force right under the six months period of Sweden's Swedish last EU presidency in 2009. Since then, a few institutional changes has appeared, but nevertheless, there is an important role still to play for the EU presidencies and the rotating ones. We will talk about these, these matters during this uh, seminar, the role of the rotating presidency and particular focus on the French uh, current EU presidency. And to our help, I'm really happy that we have four excellent speakers that will each present uh, some of their findings and thoughts on these matters. And I will present them as I also introduce the structure of this webinar. First, we will listen to Ambassador of France to Stockholm, Etienne de Gonville. He will outline the uh, general program of the French EU presidency that is right now uh, underway. After his presentation, we will hear a presentation of a new European policy analysis issued at CIEPS. And this one is written by Associate Professor Olivier Rosenberg. He's Associate Professor at the Sciences Po in Paris. And he has written this interesting preview or discussing the setting and the role of the French EU presidency with the title, A Political Presidency, the 2022 French Presidency of the Council of the European Union. You can, of course, find this uh, analysis uh, to download it on our website. After this, we will turn to the more general uh, uh, role of the EU presidency and listen to an, a presentation of another paper that we have just published at CIEPS. It's written by Auste Vasmonite, and he has the title, Entrepreneurs of Compromise? Question mark. The Rotating Presidency of the Council of the EU after Lisbon. And that will provide a general view on the roles and the functions of the rotating presidency. And last but certainly not least, Eva Sjögren. She is the Director General of EU Affairs at the Prime Minister's Office in Sweden. And she will make comments on all of these discussions we've had, but also perhaps give us a little bit of a view towards the Swedish EU presidency as she is currently very much involved in these preparations. Eva has a long experience working on EU matters in Swedish uh, ministries, both in Stockholm and in Brussels. And in this context, we should also mention that she has been the director of CIEPS. So welcome to you all. I'm very much looking forward to discussing these matters with you. Once the presentations are over, we will also have a panel discussion among us. To those of you following this live stream, we don't have a Q&A function, so, uh, but please do not hesitate to contact CIEPS in whichever way you find possible, and we like to hear your views on these matters that we talk about during this seminar. Now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome Ambassador Etienne de Gonville, and I will now hand over to you to give your presentation. 
Thank you very much, uh, Yaran, and uh, thanks to SIEPS for the opportunity this morning to, to discuss our own experience uh, as, we, as we start uh, this uh, EU uh, presidency of the Council uh, of Ministers. And, and thank you for the interesting panel that you have uh, assembled this morning. So I will um, maybe um, use a few slides to, to give you a hint about uh, what we are doing and uh, what our ambitions are. Uh, and I guess this will be a good starting point for, uh, for our other panelists uh, then to comment on uh, um, how they think it's going actually to play out. So um, um, every presidency has a logo and a slogan and, and, uh, and ours uh, indicates uh, with this arrow in the center a, a willingness to move forward. And uh, the way we approach our presidency of the Council of the European Union is indeed to be able to help the European Union move forward uh, and play our role uh, in, uh, in, in, with this ambition. Our slogan, relance, puissance, appartenance, recovery, strength, and a sense of belonging um, is the consequence of a different crisis we've been through uh, in, in recent months and years. And, and also the general um, uh, vision uh, that France, together with uh, other, the other members of the European Union, want to develop for the, for the future of Europe. Um, I, will, I will not go into too many details about um, the, the way the decision-making process uh, in the EU is organized post-Lisbon, because my other panelists, uh, fellow panelists, will do it. But just a reminder that the responsibility we have uh, uh, as the chair in the current context is only uh, the, uh, the, the chair of uh, the body that is at the lower left angle of the screen. The Council of the European Union that assembles the 27 ministers uh, of the European Union and which in a negotiation uh, with the European Parliament, that is co-legislator, um, elaborates EU law on the basis of the proposals of the European Commission. So in this, um, um, in this arrangement, the European Council, now chaired by a permanent uh, president, currently Charles Michel, uh, gives the general orientation. The European Commission has the initiative to propose texts to uh, implement a new EU legislation, and the Council of the European Union and the Europa European Parliament approve together the text after negotiation. So um, our role is to make sure that there is a consensus inside the Council representing the different uh, nation states uh, that compose the European Union, a consensus on the different proposals um, <clears throat> to um, elaborate a common position and then to represent the Council in the negotiation with the European Parliament and in the dialogue with the European Commission. Um, it's, it's a humble role uh, where the chair has to be neutral uh, and has to play the role of a harness broker. This is the definition, uh, technically, of uh, what we're supposed to do. But at the same time, every rotating presidency brings uh, with it uh, the reality of a democratically elected government, the reality of one of the nation states of uh, the European Union, and the political class that goes with it. So there is this technical role, this harness broker role, but there is a little more to that uh, in the way a country like France um, approaches its, its own presidency of the Council of the European Union. We want, uh, at the same time, uh, take the occasion to talk more about Europe, uh, it, to talk more about Europe in Europe, but also to our own population, and to seize the European moment. Uh, there is a European moment. Uh, we, we, we think it, is, um, it gives us opportunities to move, to move Europe forward, to give it uh, new ambitions, and to move towards what President Macron defined uh, in his uh, uh, different interventions at the uh, uh, opening of this presidency, um, to move towards a Europe that is seen as one of the world powers, that is sovereign, that is free of its choices, and master of its destiny. Uh, of course, something that cannot be achieved only during the six months of the EU presidency, but um, that gives a, a compass, an orientation, a, a, a sense of a movement uh, to what we, we want to do. <clears throat> We're not doing it alone. 
And you've already introduced that. Uh, uh, we are now under the, the Lisbon arrangement in a trio of uh, three successive presidencies, which gives us uh, uh, some perspective and some continuity in, uh, in the work that we are doing. Uh, we're doing it, uh, of course, with the uh, Czech Republic and, and Sweden, and Eva will uh, be able to elaborate on that uh, later on. We're doing it uh, all over France. Uh, it was a conscious decision to uh, take Europe closer to our citizens and to make sure that the different meetings of uh, the presidency uh, would take place in uh, as many towns as possible in France. And you can see that we have more or less covered the whole territory that is going to be a tour de France uh, of Europe um, on the occasion of this presidency. So as I said, we're going to talk more about Europe in Europe, but also uh, in France and bringing uh, closer to, uh, to the citizens. What are we going to do uh, in, in, uh, in this presidency? Um, we, we have um, um, a lot of uh, ambitions, but they do not come out of nowhere. They are uh, the results of uh, the priorities that were set by the um, European Council and also of what was on the table of the Commission uh, when we uh, started our presidency, and what is now in the program of the trio that we formed with the Czech Republic and, and uh, Sweden. So that there are no surprises in, uh, in what we're doing. Uh, it is in tune with the priorities that we have um, uh, defined together in this European moment, and that uh, we are with, we, we've made sure, thanks to the uh, work program of the trio, uh, that uh, the work that we are initiating will be continued by the uh, Czech Republic and Sweden. First of the three uh, priorities that we have defined, a more sovereign Europe, um, a, a Europe that is respected and that is master of its destiny. And it starts uh, with um, um, concrete measures to uh, take back control of our borders. Uh, don't want to take a slogan that has been used by others, but in a sense, uh, it's the idea. Uh, make, making sure that the external borders of uh, Europe are indeed under our control, that we are not just uh, the victims of uh, external crises, uh, external migration crises that, uh, that come to us, and that we have taken all, the, all of the lessons of uh, the crisis of uh, 2015. Um, so we have a uh, migration and asylum pact to negotiate um, on which we are trying to find new methods to overcome uh, current blockades. We also want to make the Schengen zone more robust um, uh, to um, uh, update uh, the Schengen code and to make it more political, to make sure that uh, we have a, a political body that discusses the, uh, the, the rules in the Schengen area just, have, just as we have one in the Eurozone with the finance ministers. The, um, uh, the intuition here is that freedom of movement uh, in, inside the European Union, Union will not be uh, preserved in the future, will not be sustainable if we do not have uh, a more robust control of our external border. Then we, uh, uh, we also define a more sovereign Europe by its ability to bring prosperity and stability to its neighborhood. And uh, of course, uh, we are investing a lot in the management of the uh, uh, current crisis uh, between Russia and Ukraine, um, or, or Russia and Europe more, 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 more globally. Um, but um, we are going also to put some effort in uh, the um, uh, new deal between the European Union and Africa with uh, an EU um, slash uh, uh, African Union summit mid-February in, uh, in France and, um, uh, and, and another uh, summit in June uh, on the Balkans. Uh, third leg of uh, this uh, more sovereign Europe is security and defense, uh, with in particular the negotiation of the strategic compass, which we hope will be ready by uh, the European uh, Council uh, of March. Second priority, a new European growth model. The um, general idea is to make sure that the recovery we are experiencing now post-COVID is going to be continued in the future uh, with a sustainable trend of growth uh, for our economies, given that at the same time, we had already initiated the green and the digital transitions. 
So we we have to uh, work on uh, on those two dimensions of uh, of the development of our economies, how to preserve a, a high degree of macroeconomic stability, so that we do not experience more shocks in this uh, post-COVID period, and at the same time, how to accompany uh, the transitions. Uh, a lot of texts are on the table uh, on uh, the fit for on the green transition with the fit for fifty five package with the Digital Services Act and the Digital Market Act. And we are concretely negotiating on this text um, uh, in the uh, different uh, formats of uh, tri trilogues. And, and then on some of them, we're, we are already uh, beyond that. Um, uh, but we will also have to discuss, maybe without taking any decisions at this point, uh, the new type of uh, rules uh, we will want for the future to to accompany the development of uh, uh, the the, the uh, European economies. That will be done uh, during an exceptional uh, European Council uh, in France on the 10 and 11 of uh, of March. Um, um, and 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 then there is. Um, a third, I, I said there is the element of macroeconomic stability. There, there are the important texts on uh, the digital and the grid transition. There is a third element that is uh, as important, which is the social pillar of uh, the European construction. Um, how we make sure that uh, this economic development is accompanied by um, adequate uh, jobs for uh, our workers, adequate salaries, um, a proper gender equality in uh, in the way our societies and economies are organized. So this is also uh, an important element of what is going to be discussed during the French presidency. And then third and last priority, it resonates with uh, uh, the element of our slogan, a sense of belonging, uh, how to put Europe on a more human scale, how to make sure that it is closer to our citizens and that the sense of belonging is indeed decreased uh, in the European Union. Um, the first element is the Conference on the Future of Europe, which will give its uh, results in May. But there are a lot of other initiatives uh, from uh, Erasmus Plus um, to uh, a new European citizen service that we hope to be able to uh, launch during the French presidency um, to the values uh, of uh, the European Union, how to preserve the democratic um, element that is at the core of the European project uh, with, among others, um, um, an initiative to create a support fund for independent and investigative journalism. And also um, the willingness to uh, set up a committee on the history of Europe uh, that would consider the history of Europe from above, uh, being able to tell the history of Europe, not only from the standpoint of all of our different nation states that have very specific and limited angles uh, on the history of Europe, but um, how we can uh, task a, a group of historians uh, to, uh, to give us a, a more broad outlook on uh, what unites us after all, after all those centuries of, of common history. So I will finish here and uh, just by saying that uh, once again, this slogan is Relance, Puissance, Appartenance. But it is also important to keep in mind that uh, it doesn't um, exist without ensemble, without together, without uh, the ability to do things together and without the firm uh, um, uh, awareness that uh, the uh, presidency of the Council of the European Union is first and foremost this Hannes Barker that brings with it uh, some political impetus but that uh, that has first and foremost to build consensus, compromise, so that uh, EU legislation can be adopted and Europe can advance. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for this uh, bird's eye view, uh, but also details on the on the actual program and the priorities. Now, before I uh, hand over to the next speaker, I'd just like to add, ask you one follow up question. Uh, um, the current situation, which is of course tense when it comes to security. Uh, and and the sort of this the the relations with the with other uh, states in in Europe. Et How do you think that affects the presidency? Because normally, as we would talk more about foreign affairs, is not really the responsibility of the presidency. But do you also see how that can have an impact on the 
sort of the the way the the French presidency works or what kind of responsibility it can take in these matters? So first of all, if we consider the situation uh, of crisis around Ukraine, um, um, from the standpoint of the French presidency and and from a a technical angle, uh, of course, the situation is very different from the situation of Georgia in 2008, when uh, President Sarkozy was uh, in the pre-Lisbon uh, situation, also the chair of the European Council. It's, uh, it's it's different this time. In terms of the uh, institutional tasks that, that we have to perform, but in terms of the uh, political commitment uh, to solving the crisis, I would say that there is no big difference. When we're, we're not speaking on behalf of Europe uh, when we uh, act within this crisis, but at the same time, uh, we've been uh, talking as France to the main actors of this crisis for a long time, uh, uh, since 2014, in the case of France and the Normandy format, uh, but, but also since President Macron was uh, was elected, um, he, he has, of course, been extremely active uh, with uh, the different actors uh, on the US side, uh, on the European side, on the uh, uh, side of uh, Ukraine and Russia. And the last um, summit uh, that had to deal with the, uh, the, the, the issue uh, was a summit that we organized in Paris in December 2019 with uh, President Putin, President Zelensky, uh, Chancellor Merkel at the time, and, and, and President Macron. And, and the effort has never ceased. So, um, so today we are still very much involved in, uh, in solving the crisis. We have at the same time this responsibility of uh, chairing the Council of the European Union. So I would just say that it gives us an extra responsibility to make sure that all European member states are well aware of uh, what France is doing, are part of uh, the elaboration of our common position, um, which is not only today a common European position, but really a transatlantic position, and, and which gives us a platform from which to speak to, uh, to the other side. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Now, we already heard about the program, and now I'm very uh, happy to hand over to Olivier Rosenberg, who, as I said, has already written this paper, which sort of play, places the presidency also in the political conditions that, it's, uh, that it finds itself in. So over to you, Olivier. Thank you, uh, Goran. I will, will not present the whole uh, note. Uh, it, it can be seen on the CIEP's uh, website, as, as you said. I would just... Uh, highlight a few a few points. Maybe uh, starting starting uh, can come back to um, an assessment of the French uh, EU position over the over the, the last year, and especially since President Macron uh, was elected in 2017. As as you may remember, he's been elected on a very pro-European credo. Um, supporting even at the symbolic level the uh, the European integration that can be explained of course well first through its home personal views uh, uh, we can we can we can make credit for to him for for that but also um, to me because he wanted to give a positive tone to his campaign at that time he wanted to settle a pro-anti-EU cleavage within French politics that would departure from the traditional right-left cleavage, uh, given that, well, he came from the left, he wanted to attract some central right voters, so the EU was um, was for him a good opportunity, really, to, 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 to make his point. And also, in addition, at that time, his uh, radical right um, challenger, Marine Le Pen, had a very um, put emphasis on criticisms vis-à-vis the EU with the uh, view at that time of of withdrawing from from the EMU. So for him, it was an an element of credibility uh, vis-à-vis her to to, to put emphasis on the EU. It was very clear on the TV debate we had uh, in 2017, which were judged judge as a failure for, for Marine Le Pen. And it was very important, for instance, for, you know, the right-wing voters, retired voters, that were uh, maybe not uh, convinced by Macron, but they are very, very afraid by, by their, the future of economy, etc. 
Macron had um, on still have uh, a pro EU credo. He also has a clear uh, strategy on the EU at that time. That's very striking with three points. First, he wanted to limit public spending in order for France to restore its credibility. It was very important. That's a lesson he had learned from his previous position as an advisor and then minister to, to, to President Hollande. Second, he proposed a reform, an ambitious reform of the EMU governance, especially with a dedicated budget for the Eurozone. And third, in addition, he made at the beginning of his, of his term uh, uh, what we can call a firework of, of, of proposals, uh, more than 50, not 15, uh, 50 proposals. And famously, in his, his speech he made in La Sorbonne at the beginning of, of, of his terms. So in the note, I, um, I try to assess the, uh, this, this policy five years after the, the beginning of, of the term of, of, of Macron. Um, what's very striking is that, to sum it up, Macron experienced initially several failure, failures on EU files. And little by little, up to nowadays, uh, these, these failures turn out to be, to be more uh, successful or to be, to be less obvious. Let me take two, three points to, to make my point. First, regarding the uh, respect of the um, public spending deficit rules, well, it uh, should be said that uh, Macron did not, was not successful to implement his, his strategy, uh, not only because of the COVID, as, as, as uh, that we have all known, but even before, with the yellow vest crisis that uh, uh, made him, him hard to comply with the deficit objectives. And you can see in the note, the, the trends regarding the public deficit. And you see that uh, even it, in, in 2019, uh, the, the, the deficit started to, to increase again. But there is a but, which is the fact that nowadays, these frugal views that were at the base of Macron's strategy have lost ground with the COVID, of course, but with also the... Uh, evolution of domestic political situation, be it in Germany with the new coalition, or be it in the Netherlands, to give two important examples, with the new uh, platform of the, of the prime minister. So this is for the EMU rules. If we look, if we consider the macro capacity of the EU, well, Macron tried to, to, to sell to, to Chancellor Merkel for two years, the reform of EMU governance, and he, he, he found a uh, skepticism, to say the less, on the part of, 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 of Germany that were uh, reluctant to implement it. But as we all know, during the COVID crisis, Chancellor Merkel turned a view on, on um, well, accepted or developed the next generation EU uh, agenda. It, there have been books nowadays to explain the shift of Merkel, and there are many consideration for this shift. But I do believe, I'm not alone, that uh, Macron push over the previous years, for three years, on uh, a greater macroeconomic capacity for the EU played a key role in the evolution of, of, uh, of, of Merkel, which, which, by the way, says a lot on the influence of France nowadays, which is uh, sorry to say it, not the number one, but the number two in terms of influence in the EU, but which can play a, um, a role in terms of agenda setting. Last element of assessments regarding uh, politics in, in, in Brussels. Uh, it's very striking that there have been initially some difficulties for, for Macron. He, he had these ambitions to renew the political game, and, well, it didn't work, and the political game is still... Uh, remain unchanged, unchanged, sorry. There have been, uh, if you do remember, some periods of tensions uh, with uh, the EP, between the EP and France in, during the last uh, European elections, when France was again the Spitzen candidate, when the French commissioner were, were rejected. But again, there is a but. If we now look at the key decision makers at the EU level, there are 
some uh, well French personality in, in, in good positions, and also at the head of EU institutions, if we can say so, pro pro French uh, pro French leader. Let me say what, one word now there about the timing of the French presidency to come back more directly on the French presidency. Um, a paradox here again with the fact that there is a window of opportunity at the EU level, at the EU level, as never over the over the last years, with the, the closeness of France with uh, this new German coalition. Well, we don't know yet exactly what the EU uh, policy, its EU policy will be, but it can say it can be said broadly speaking that they, they are, there is some proximity, some closeness between France and Germany and an especially good relations nowadays with, with, with Italy. We are also in the middle of the EU term, or close to the middle with the, with the future presidencies, which is good in terms of uh, delivering uh, decisions. EU actors uh, uh, know that it's now that they should uh, make uh, adopt key, key files, uh, before it was too early, after it will be too late. So it's uh, it's really uh, the, the money time, as we said in, in basketball. Um, also, maybe it can be said that there is a bit less populist pressure over many European countries than, let's say, three or four years ago. It's not it's not easy to, to, to judge around populists are, are here in, in, in domestic politics for, for a long time. They will not leave like that. But Maybe the pressure is, is 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 a bit less important, as we can see, with with um, the trends in in Germany, for instance. Regarding um, domestic affairs, of course, there is a, a strong politicization of EU issues to be accept, ex expected. Sorry, with the double electoral context of the presidential election in April and of the parliament election in June, so there was not only be just one election, but two, two uh, uh, elections. It means that there will be a shorter time for the uh, uh, involvement of the officials, of the ministers, of Macron. But I strongly believe that uh, bureaucracy will continue to act on day-to-day -day file, that they have strong, um, strong capacity to, to, to do it, clear instructions on how to, to proceed. Look, I'm not, therefore, I'm not afraid of a lock or a blocking of the of the EU due to this this uh, um, electoral context. Yet it can be expected regarding French politics that the EU issues will be used. It will be used by the majority by the uh, incumbent uh, uh, presidents with with some elements like the. Uh, um, tendency uh, to have a bombast aspect in the objectives. We'll come back to that. With a multiplication of the speeches of, of Macron, which is something he, he likes to do. And, uh, well, he has maybe a quality also to, to perform these uh, this, this speeches. And the multiplication of informal conceals that the investors uh, have shown. There will also be an um, electoral use by the oppositions with critics against Macron that can take the shapes of the critics against his uh, EU policy and the capacity for the oppositions to find polemics on any issues. And I put here the picture of the triumphal arc lighted in blue on the 1st of January, which became uh, an unexpected um, controversy in France with opposition saying this is a symbol of uh, uh, First World War, so we cannot put out the uh, the French flag from it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let me illustrate the bombast aspect with um, some elements. So first, the slogan of the of the French presidency has been has been has been mentioned with the notion of recovery. We can wonder uh, which recovery we are talking about. The so recovery. First and foremost, of economy, of course, but maybe also of the EU more generally, which is a credo of, of Macron in the beginning, and maybe unconsciously a recovery of Macron himself, who is willing to to stand again as a as president. The notion of power has been since the very beginning of the European integration at the core 
of the French narrative with the notion of Europe puissance, power Europe, the view that thanks to Europe, France could find back, find back some of its lost prestige. Belonging, the sense of belonging, appartenance, refers to uh, the feelings of the citizens. And here there are reasons for, for putting in front the how citizens um, perceive the European Union, not only the fact that elections will happen soon, but also the state of public opinion in France regarding the EU. And I put in the in the note this, this table from the famous, famous Eurobarometer uh, survey, where you can see that the share of French citizens who have a negative views of the EU, 22, uh, 22 persons, is above the uh, EU average. And I see that as a result of a decade of politicization of EU, of EU uh, topics by the radical right, by the radical left, and also by the center, by Macron's uh, strategy to put uh, the EU cleavage at the core of, of, uh, of uh, politics. So regarding the bombast, as, as promised, uh, uh, I, I took that from the official press pack of the French presidency. It's in French, but I can, I can bring you some elements of translation on some of the priorities of, of the French presidency, a new model for growth or, or on investment, um, promotion of European values, promotion of protection of youth, the notion of culture, the significance of health. So there is this, this strong uh, ambition, which has to do with uh, maybe the general relation of France with the EU, but also with the, with the electoral context for, for sure. And you've seen the map with a large number of, of, of meetings. Um, I think I should, I should not be, be too long again. So uh, uh, I will not develop the uh, agenda of the, of, the, of the presidency as it has been uh, relevantly done by the, by the uh, ambassador. It's striking to see that there is a mix of short-term files uh, on long-term issues related to democracy, to economy, and to geopolitics. And, and uh, uh, vital, vital files, long-term files. Just so to conclude, um, there is a paradox on the fact that at the policy level, there is a uh, forcible presidency. We know what which fights are within the pipeline. We know which issues, long-term issues, will be addressed on economy and democracy. And we have uh, experienced, uh, talented senior bureaucrats at work, which for sure will deliver compromises on, on key issues. So there is a, a forcible a path in that sense, but uh, two uncertainties. First, an uncertainty is regarding uh, ongoing events at the, at the EU and world le level, it has been the case during the previous French presidency of 2008, with three crises at, at that time. And now we know that uh, a new, any event could, could happen and could, could um, well, force the French presidency to, to, to to adapt to, to new context, maybe in Ukraine, maybe elsewhere, or maybe not, we don't know. The second uncertainty has to do with French politics. And if, and if a radical right candidate was elected or was in a position to win only uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the second round, it could, it could change the faith of this, uh, of this French presidency with uh, probably locks probably tensions between, between France and uh, the rest of the member states at the time France will have the, the, the presidency. I'm not saying in it is likely, I'm just saying it's possible and it should be considered as a possible option. Thank you. Well, merci beaucoup, Olivier. Thanks a lot for a well-structured and interesting talk. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we will come back in the discussion. Uh, I'm also pretty confident the amb ambassador will have some uh, some points to make here on, on this uh, notion of the French EU policy. Just before we move on, a quick question uh, that 
if you look at these domestic conditions and the role of domestic politics with the with regard of the presidency, you point to how Macron probably we use this, uh, you know, making speeches, the informal summits. If you would point to one concrete dossier that the French president or presidency will be very eager to deliver as a concrete result before the presidential election to show to the French uh, public, what would that be? I would say, can I take the rest, that uh, the adequate uh, minimal wages, because it speaks to anyone, the notion of uh, minimal wages, and because the lack of social Europe has been pointed to for years by, by the left, including by pro-EU uh, forces mm -hmm. like the socialist one. So uh, there is a possibility to have uh, something like an agreement on, 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 on that, um, he, he, he will take it. And uh, I know Sweden is very expected on that context. Yes, indeed. It's interesting for us, a Swedish audience, to consider that. Thank you so much, Olivier. And we will come back in the, in the discussion. Now we have to rush on and we will now broaden the scope and look at the role of the presidency. And when I introduced Auster Vasnunite, I forgot to mention her affiliation. She is at the Ghent University and she has quite recently written a PhD, which precisely deals with the role of the rotating presidency. And I think your paper draws also on that material. Very happy to have you here and I now give you the floor. Thank you very much. And indeed, today I would like to talk about the, the roles of the rotating presidency in the general EU institutional setting, and especially how these roles changed after the, the, the Treaty of Lisbon. I will now uh, share my presentation with you. So in 2009, when the Treaty of Lisbon entered into force, uh, it brought a few main changes. So, so first of all, it established the, the role of the president of the European Council. It extended the powers of high representative for foreign affairs and security policy. And it also institutionalized the trio presidency and the Eurogroup. So basically, these changes took away the political leadership role of the rotating presidency, mainly by the establishment of the president of the European Council. Basically, the European Council was separated from the Council of the EU, and the rotating presidency is not uh, any longer the chair of the European Council. The extension of powers uh, of high representative uh, also means that now the foreign affairs council meetings are chaired by the high representative and not any longer by the rotating chair of the council. Um, the high representative also took over the external representation role um, uh, of the EU. Um, so also curbed the powers of the rotating presidency in, in, in this regard. Uh, in addition to this, um, even though uh, it was introduced before the Treaty of Lisbon, the trio presidency was institutionalized by, 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 by the Lisbon. And now the three member states which compose the trio have to issue a common 18-month program, which um, basically works as a general framework for separate presidency semesters. Uh, similarly, the Eurogroup as well was uh, established before Lisbon, but it was recognized by it. And now the matters which concern uh, Eurozone members uh, fall out of the discretion of the rotating presidency as well. So uh, basically with the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, the presidency retained more uh, administrative roles. So uh, it is a manager of the council meetings, it is a mediator during the negotiations, and it also represents the Council vis-à-vis -vis the European Commission and the European Parliament. These changes notwithstanding, uh, the rotating presidency still maintains uh, certain powers and can still exert influence, for example, during the legislative process, and in particular during the first reading and the final stages of the ordinary legislative procedure, which now applies in majority of policy fields in the EU. Uh, so the, the, the presidency can, for example, um, use the informational advantage to drag the final outcome of the legislation closer to its ideal point. Um, trilogues is another venue where the presidency can, can um, pursue its own goals uh, and, and uh, where it can uh, pursue its, its, its uh, uh, preferences and priorities, because uh, these informal meetings between the European Commission, uh, the European Parliament and the Council are normally held behind the closed doors. And so the rotating presidency can report back the, the outcomes of these meetings to the Council the way that is more favorable for the rotating presidency. 
Uh, cooperation with the European Commission is also essential to have a legislative influence because the European Commission generally tends to put forward uh, certain proposals when the priorities of the Commission are in line with those of the rotating presidency. And also the cooperation with the European Parliament is, is, is also crucial because during the ordinary legislative procedure, the European Parliament and the uh, Council are equal co-legislators, so the, the, the Act cannot be adopted without one or the other. It is important to note here that regardless of this uh, informational advantage that the rotating presidency has do, during the legislative process, it does not have any exceptional voting powers. Um, the other set of, of powers that the, the presidency has is the management, basically, of the Council agenda. So what the rotating presidency can do, it can emphasize or de-emphasize certain issues on the council agenda in line with, with its priorities, for instance. How this can be done uh, by determining the frequency or timing of council meetings, by organizing informal meetings. Uh, their leading presidency can also exclude issues from the agenda or present some compromise proposals which are actually unacceptable to member states or also remain silent and in this way prevent any progress during the negotiations to be made. Um, what is important to note here is that uh, this agenda management power is more expressed in policy fields which fall under the shared competences between the EU and the member states. And while um, in general, uh, agenda management can be used really as a power to, to put forward own priorities of the presidency uh, during normal times, during crisis, uh, this power is, is, is used more like to, to achieve a compromise and so the presidency acts more as an honest broker. In fact, um, crisis management is not officially recognized as a responsibility of the presidency. But if we think about it, since 2009, majority of rotating presidencies in one way or the other had to deal with, uh, with crisis. In my analysis, I look at um, two uh, cases, uh, so migration crisis in 2015, where I compare Latvian and Luxembourgish presidencies, and also the COVID pandemic in 2020, uh, where I compare Croatian and German presidencies. What can be summarized of this whole analysis is that basically factors which facilitate the rotating presidency in responding uh, to, to crisis is, first of all, uh, having experience in holding the rotating presidency, um, also adequate administrative resources, because of course, um, unexpected events, they force the member state to shift attention and resources from uh, their, their prioritized topics to the emerging ones. Flexibility is also crucial here, as well as good relationship with the European Commission. The rotating presidency as such, does not really take the leadership in, in, in crisis management. The leadership role is normally taken by the European Council and followed up by, by the European Commission. The rotating presidency during crisis acts more as an entrepreneur of compromise, meaning that when the time comes to actually uh, take certain uh, decisions and to adopt the legislation, the rotating presidency tries to achieve as quick as possible a common uh, decision and, and, and to reach a compromise. What are the main means for this is, um, th th these are the same ones, basically determining the frequency and timing of formal or, or, or informal meetings. Um, the crisis themselves, they, they generally tend to be very different and they also have different aspects. Um, the one aspect that I touched upon in my analysis is symmetry or asymmetry. And in fact, um, migration crisis and COVID pandemic, they really uh, very well illustrate the difference between the two. So for example, migration crisis was an asymmetric shock, meaning that Southern European member states were mainly affected by the influx of migrants. And as you may recall, some other member states were actually quite reluctant to share the burden, which also was uh, difficult for the, for the rotating presidency, rotating presidencies, in these two semesters to achieve uh, a common decision and to find a common ground. Um, the COVID pandemic instead, even though it started as, a, as an asymmetric shock, because it first of all um, mainly spread in Southern Europe as well, uh, eventually the virus touched the, all member states equally and they were all equally concerned and equally uh, willing to, to find a compromise, which also facilitated the rotating presidencies in finding common solutions. 
Um, so basically, just to 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 sum up, um, the Treaty of Lisbon uh, it introduced more continuity, and especially more continuity in the fields which are characterized by high politics, so uh, dealt by the, the high representatives, such as foreign affairs. When we talk about the legislative process, um, the rotating presidency still can exert certain influence, and especially during trilogues, which are becoming more and more frequent feature of EU decision making. It can also emphasize or de-emphasize certain issues on the council agenda, although this is more evident in policy fields under the shared competences between the EU and the member states. And when it comes to crisis, crisis in a way present a burden uh, because member states may need to shift their attention from prioritized topics to some uh, emerging topics and, and, and therefore they cannot really pursue their own goals. But at the same time, crisis also provide an opportunity to act as an honest broker, to act as an efficient manager. And symmetric crisis in particular, they provide more opportunities for the rotating presidency to act as entrepreneur of compromise compared to the asymmetric ones. So. Thank you very much uh, well, for this. Thank you, Auster, for this extremely efficient and clear presentation. Uh, like I've done with the other speakers, I'd like to just add one follow-up question. One thing that is often discussed when it comes to the country holding the presidency, it's the size of the country, small versus big countries. From your research, what would you say, is there is there a, a tangible difference of the conditions, whether one is from a smaller state or from a bigger member state? Uh, perhaps the, the, the main difference, which can also impact the performance of the presidency, can be the resources that it can uh, pro attach to the presidency. Um, new member states, relatively new member states and small member states often have way less resources. And this can also be in a way a burden, especially if, if the member state needs to, if the presidency needs to deal with, with crisis, this can be problematic. So bigger member states in fact have more resources uh, and, and, and this, this can be a, a great facilitator. Uh, in terms of the general uh, roles, uh, Probably not so much, uh, except for the fact that when we, we talk about France, it, it has generally uh, more weight um, overall in Europe. But but in terms of official institutional roles, this is probably not exactly what should what should determine the performance. As as my analysis showed, that even smaller member states can be very effective, very very efficient managers. Well, thank you so much. And that provides, of course, the perfect uh, uh, way over to when I am handing over now to Eva Sjögren, who I know has been working during the two previous uh, presidencies that Sweden has held in 2001-2009, and therefore have some significant experience. And uh, we are very much looking forward to hearing your uh, comments, reflections on what we've heard, but also perhaps looking a little bit to the future. Over to you, Eva. Thank you so much, uh, Göran and CEPS, for organizing this webinar, a very timely topic, I, I have to say. And also thanks to Austin and Olivier for, for your interesting presentations and papers, and also to you at the end. And I would like to also say thanks for the excellent cooperation within the trio, of course. Um, and it's interesting to see it now starts. So, uh, but also spring 2023, actually getting closer. <laughs> this is something I experience every day in, in office. And it is, as you know, the Sweden's third presidency since we be, became a member of, of the union. And, and I would like to use my intervention here to make a few reflections, uh, what the presidency means for a country of the size of Sweden. Uh, and, and I am personally a very strong advocate of the rotating presidency. Yes, as you pointed out, Austin, it has been substantial changes after the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, but I believe that the present system needs to be uh, preserved to keep all member states, also the smaller ones, within our system of decision making. Uh, let me explain. Looking back to our first presidency in 2001, it was very different. It was a different era, uh, EU 15. Um, one could actually calculate qualified majority when sitting in council in your head. Now you need an app, otherwise it's impossible. Well, some people might, but I cannot. Uh, but it was a true 
eye-opener um, for all of us civil servants, but also for Swedish politicians, I imagine, uh, working during this time. I was at the Perm Rep in, in 2001 in Brussels, and it was actually fascinating. And I think this was not only because I was young, <laughs> but it was fascinating to see how the council actually worked from within. The role of the council secretariat, how the commission really functioned, um, and how discussions with the European Parliament really worked. This is, I mean, for an older member states, this is of course um, everyday life, but for new ones, as we were in 2001, this was extremely important. Another eye-opener, I think, is the other member states. Because to be an efficient and professional presidency, it is of utmost importance, as I think in any negotiation, to understand the reasons behind different positions. So it was not only to experience the Brussels from within, but also an increased understanding for uh, other member states' positions. You know, there is this joke of, of Swedish civil servants going to Brussels uh, in, in the end of the 90s, always claiming in Sweden we have a system. And then we sort of believed everyone would, would um, uh, go, go on our path. But that's not really how it works, as we know. <laughs> uh, but finally, I think also to see how other member states also worked towards a presidency or how other member states work the Commission or the European Parliament. This was also something that you as a presidency discovered. Um, and I think, as we all know, um, a presidency of the European, of the Council, is not about securing everything in your own country's interests. You have to find compromises, preferred, accepted by as many as possible, of course. You can focus on things and you can um, put the spotlight on some aspects, but you have to be an honest broker. And if not, I believe that you will lose influence after the presidency. So uh, the knowledge you achieve from a presidency on a civil service level, as well as the political level, can be an important tool to secure influence on the agenda agenda after presidency. And the contacts you also make can be extremely valuable after presidency. And this is more important for smaller member states, because if you are one of the big ones, everyone wants to talk to you all the time. <laughs> but if you are a smaller member state, during the presidency, of course, everyone wants to talk to you all the time. So you need to, you need to keep those contacts afterwards. Uh, but these contacts and the knowledge will have to be updated. I mean, we have new civil servants entering the, the system and also new politicians. So that's why I think it's important with the rotating presidency. And looking at Sweden in the EU, I believe that we've been the most efficient member in the union and with efficient, I mean, influence around our presidencies in 2001 and 2009. Because before presidency, you have the commission listening more closely to what you prioritize. And after presidency, you can make good use of the knowledge uh, you have achieved and the contacts we have made. So this is my vision for uh, the Swedish civil service working on EU matters, that we will prolong this um, period of influence after the presidency, um, uh, so it's, it's, it's as long as, as, as possible. And I'm also trying to send the message now running up to the presidency uh, that it is really a true professional privilege to experience uh, an EU presidency from the Perm Rep or also from Stockholm or, or um, from the ministries or, or agencies in Sweden. Uh, now a few words on our upcoming presidency. There are of course changes and similarities compared to the previous ones, but the main objective is of course the same, to take the agenda forward 
and to close as much as possible, as we know. Uh, and looking at next spring, I mean, we will not have an election in the middle of our presidency, as the case of France, but we will have elections in September, as you know. And this is new because this was not the case in 2001 and 2009. And in 2001, you had this uh, agreement. Uh, it was a minority government, but there was this agreement um, uh, between the government and the opposition that a successful Swedish presidency was a Swedish priority. Uh, and in 2009, it was a majority government. And for 2023, we do not know, of course. This, this uh, makes the preparations a bit special. The priorities for the Swedish presidency will, of course, be finalized, as for every presidency, a month before. So for us, it's December. But the present government is, of course, working closely with different parties within the, within the parliament in order to make sure that everyone is sort of... Um, within the planning. Uh, but the final decision on, on the actual priorities will have to be done after the next uh, election. So, and of course, it depends <laughs> on how much uh, France and the Czech Republic will, will um, uh, be able to finalize, of course. Uh, but I think <laughs> one can say quite sure that we are moving towards the end of the legislative period. So we believe we will have quite a lot on our plate. Um, and I think we will have a lot of dossiers in trialogues with the European Parliament. Look at this huge climate package, the Fit for 55, I think is the largest legislative package any commission has put on the Council agenda and the European Parliament ever actually. And the whole migration, um, just to mention a few. And, and um, we also have to prepare for the unexpected, as we've also heard about. And COVID is a constant reminder, of course. We had our share of crisis in 2001 and 2009. Different magnitude, of course. 2001, we had this foot and mouth disease, I don't know if you remember, in the UK. But it was actually a, a, a crisis with, with uh, quite political, substantial effects. And in 2009, we had the financial crisis. So, but we prepared for an intensive legislative period. Uh, and I think um, a lot of work will have to be done in Brussels. And our two ambassadors, I think they will be occupied in trilogues <laughs> all the time. Um, a comment on the importance of the presidency also after the Lisbon Treaty. I've, I've already talked about the importance for a smaller member state, talking about contacts and experience. Uh, but that even if the, the responsibility when it comes to the foreign policy and European Council has changed, as you also pointed out, the number of, of um, areas with co-decision has been uh, increased substantially. And I think the role of the presidency in negotiating with the European Parliament cannot and should not be underestimated. And I think uh, we believe that this role needs to be highlighted and thoroughly discussed um, uh, between member states because uh, we are in the hands of the presidency, making sure that the council position is duly defended when negotiating with the European Parliament. And it used to be seen as a problem that it takes time to legislate within the European Union. And this, of course, still may be true that it takes some time. But I think it's important to also remember that all presidencies are aware of the risk of putting speed and number of finalized dossiers as a higher priority than the quality of the legislation. And you need, as always, find the right balance here. <laughs> but I think one has to be aware of this and that it's extremely important talking about the institutional balance that you have precedences, not only regarding themselves as honest brokers within council, but also taking the role of the council in the negotiations with the European Parliament 
most seriously. Finally, um, talking about um, meetings and meetings also in Sweden, I was impressed uh, by the spread of the meetings in France. Uh, and I, I wish you all the best with these meetings. And we are also preparing, of course, for meetings uh, here in Sweden. And, and I think this is something that cannot be underestimated. We have experienced COVID now for a few presidencies where there hasn't been possible to have informal meetings. And I think capitals, uh, civil servants, politicians, they have to meet. We cannot only even though um, uh, the permanent representations in Brussels, they will have to be the captains of every presidency, but we also have to have meetings where capitals meet, uh, and not only in capitals, <laughs> but in, 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 in member states. So I think um, ever closer union among the people of Europe, uh, as it's stated in the treaty, we have to make sure that civil servants and politicians also meet informally. And for us and for others, I think it's, it's, um, import, it's an important chance to also show Sweden to other member states and try to explain who we are, where we come from, and why we think either this or that. So I think this is something that we will try to use the informal meetings in Sweden next spring and cross fingers that this will be possible and that not a, a new variant of COVID will stop us. With that, I, I um, thanks again, Joran, and I'm happy to continue the discussions. Thank you. Well, well, thank you so much, Eva, for all these, uh, I mean, a, a dozen of uh, uh, great points where we can discuss further. I, before I let you go this round, I, I just like as with the others to ask a follow-up, and it deals with this now, in the end, you talk about the informal meetings, uh, and, and obviously the other speakers have also mentioned informal meetings as a way of also having this agenda-setting role of the presidency, while we are, in principle, talking about the honest broker and the legislative process. This is an area where you can put your, say, let's say national flavor to, to, the, to the agenda. But in that sense, isn't, after all, the fact that the uh, elections, general elections this September, I mean, it's, a, it's an obvious question. Doesn't it make it harder? Because in order to do this, you need to plan ahead uh, what we can actually do in the spring of, of uh, 23. So uh, I just, my question would be, <laughs> the agenda setting function of the presidency would seem a bit politically difficult this time around. No, that's true. And, and as a civil servant, this is something that we, are, of course, have to, it's, it's the reality uh, but then again, perhaps one have to um, uh, point out and, and, uh, and um, remember that, that uh, an advantage of, of Swedish EU policy, I think, is that we have some common ground um, that looking, looking back, uh, there are some, some priorities for, for EU affairs uh, that is widely shared in the Swedish parliament. So a bit irrespectively, of the color of the government, I think um, um, uh, an efficient internal market, for example, that is not uh, politically difficult in Sweden to have an, an active trade policy. Everyone is on board. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there are some things in, in Swedish EU policy, rule of law, for example. So uh, I, I think this is something that is, of course, discussed in political circles, but, but it, it doesn't have to be a problem. So, mm. and it should not be a problem. Interesting. But I, I think there are, during these presentations, there are a number of axes that have emerged, I think, that are important. We, of course, can talk more about those as substantive fields, because as uh, Olivier pointed out, this is a period where we also expect lots of legislation to be going through the systems. But I have at least four items I think I, I placed here on the on my little notebook. One, the first one that several of you have pointed to is the fact of domestic politics as a constraint or an opportunity for, for the presidency. presidency. The second one deals a little bit with this agenda setting role. I mean, the extent to which you can actually use that as a presidency. And the third one, which is a bit difficult, I guess it's this, how to prepare for the unexpected and what can be expected from the presidency when an unexpected event actually happens. And Auster, you talked about this. 
And then the fourth one I have on my list would be a little bit sort of the presidency in context and the relations that you have to maintain with other institutions, but also perhaps with other member states. And if we're lucky enough to have the time, I think at least we can try to touch upon a few of these uh, questions when we now go into the panel discussion. And please just try to signal to me when you want to enter. But I think at this moment, I would like to uh, hand back to the ambassador, uh, Etienne de Gonville. Now you've listened to these presentations, and uh, when you hear these presentations also about the, the role, I mean, the, the French EU policies, of course, from Olivier, but also the role of presidency, what would be your reflections about where France is in all of this and what we can, what we can expect during the next uh, uh, five months uh, of a French leadership of the EU? Uh, thank you, Yaron. And f well, first of all, I would like to to uh, to thank uh, uh, Oste, Olivier, and Eva for the quality of the presentations because I uh, I'm actually learning a lot on uh, on what France is doing or should be doing during its uh, presidency, and also on uh, on the historical perspective uh, from uh, from practitioners of Brussels. Um, uh, I, I, maybe I, I would just like to um, to continue the the, uh, the discussion on the basis of the uh, the theme that you just mentioned. Uh, domestic policy as a constraint and, and 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 there to reflect on two elements first of all the um uh, the impact of domestic elections uh, and, and and second uh, the impact of the domestic political agenda so first of all the impact on the, on the of the elections i think it's interesting that um there was a small debate in france on whether we should have postponed our presidency because we had elections during the presidency etc cetera, etc cetera. If we, if we start doing that, um, uh, we will at some point consider that the best uh, of all worlds is to have no elections at all. Uh, and, and, and that, of course, would be a, a major damage to our democratic identity. So elections are a reality of what we are, and we just have to live with it, uh, even if those intervene during a presidency or just before a presidency, because as Eva pointed out, um, Sweden is in no better position uh, regarding its, its own democratic process. It has an impact on the way we are going to uh, handle those two presidencies, the French one and the Swedish one. But it's just it's, it's just the way our life is organized, and uh, and and we can we can perfectly uh, live with it. It will have a small impact in the way the French presidency is organized on on a uh, in in a logistical uh, manner. We have to concentrate most of the ministerial meetings during the first half of the presidency. But the presidency is not stopping because of the elections. It will go indeed until the end of June. And on the substance, we have anyway the program of work of the trio of the presidency. So there will be a continuity uh, whether or not uh, there are elections. Last point, um, uh, will we have a major change of, our, of political orientation after the elections? Well, I, I, have, I don't know and I cannot comment on that. I would just um, refer you to the paper of Olivier, uh, who at some point points out the fact that since 1957, uh, there has been a remarkable continuity in, uh, in the way France has contributed to uh, the European Union construction. So that's for the first uh, part, our, our democratic processes. Then um, the influence of the domestic agenda on, on the way uh, we structure our presidency. Um, I think, as Oste pointed out in a research, um, the agenda setting in, in the post-Lisbon uh, configuration is, is, is quite limited for the presidency. We have some margin of, of maneuver. We can put some political uh, uh, impetus on some aspects, and this is definitely what we're doing. We're using our political capital to, to make uh, Europe go forward. But at the same time, uh, this agenda is heavily determined by the priorities that have been set up by the, uh, council, the European Council, by uh, what the Commission has been doing and uh, by what we think we can achieve during uh, the trio. I would, however, uh, react on what of one of the uh, mentions uh, that Olivier made of uh, the strength element in, in the uh, uh, French priorities. Uh, I think Olivier uh, said that um, by, by this slogan of strength, France is usually uh, trying to find back some of its lost prestige. I, I, I would question that uh, in the current uh, state of the European construction. Uh, first of all, because 
I, I don't know what lost prestige we're talking about. I, I do acknowledge that in French politics, it is sometimes a recurring theme. That uh, uh, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the time when we had a colonial empire? Are we talking about the time before 19, our defeat in 1940? Are we talking about the time before our defeat in 1970, in 1870 uh, against Prussia? Uh, are we talking about the time of the first empire, uh, the time of Louis the Fourteenth? Um, we've had so many uh, ups and downs in our history that no one actually knows what we're talking about. And really for our decision make, the, the French decision makers or politicians who are looking forward and not backwards, it is not really about France finding back its lost prestige or finding its own national strength uh, uh, through um, some kind of EU leadership. It is really about us being stronger together as a bloc, as, as the European Union. And the discussion we are having today about a more geopolitical Europe is not about France being stronger or, or, or Germany being stronger or Sweden for that matter, because you also had an empire in Sweden. Uh, it's about us as Europeans being stronger in front of uh, or in the context of a geopolitical, geopolitical order, which is more aggressive, which exercises more pressure on us and on which we against pressures against which we should be better prepared. So what we want to achieve as a presidency is make sure, making sure that the European Union is better prepared to face the unforeseen crisis of the future that you mentioned, Joran, that we are better prepared, stronger, uh, more respected, and more in control of our future. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, uh, Etienne. And I think this uh, should make... I, I hand over directly to Olivier because I think, uh, obviously, we should not talk about hist history or all this uh, uh, seminar, but, but indeed, there is a, a concept here which has been discussed quite a lot about the uh, puissance, about the more mm -hmm. more powerful Europe. And and, and could you perhaps uh, engage them with what the ambassador said and, and go yes, back to your yes, point? Yes. Uh, what I mean, you know, I was a bit provocative saying that France wants to find back its lost uh, empire through, through, through the EU. Um, still, I think there is something, something uh, true on the, you know, the universalistic, uh, a conception of, of, of politics, of values that is at the heart of French political culture and the, the, the choice for, for your better a follow up with, with that trend. But I was uh, actually a bit um, positive in my assessment in comparison, for instance, with, with um, British uh, officials or British politicians. When I interview them, uh, after a while, you understand that. They have not fully accepted the fact that they are not anymore ruling the world in a way. It's been different for French elites because, well, they lost wars during the 20th century. They lost uh, their empire. And, and um, in a way, they have accepted that. And the, the deepness of the commitment of the successive French presidents uh, uh, can, can be partly... Uh, explained by the fact that we have more uh, realistic relations to, 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 to the size of the country. Um, I'd like, to, ah, so let, yeah. let, let's stop here as far as yeah, the debate. It, no, it's great. I mean, I, it's, this, is, this is also a topic for, for at least one or two seminars in detail. But maybe if we go to contemporary politics, I would like to ask you, Olivier, one thing, which, because I know you follow also, of course, the French uh, presidential elections. Now we talked quite a lot about how the French elections may impact uh, the presidency. But uh, what if we turn it around? So we know that we talked about the role and, and, and for the, for the uh, head of government or state, there is not a particular role in the presidency uh, as we've discussed, but, but nevertheless, Emmanuel Macron is a very active European politician for sure. Is there a risk that being holding the presidency, being this active at the European stage, it may actually have a negative impact on his uh, capacity to, uh, to perform the presidential campaign? With lots of expectations of doing foreign policy, I mean, there are only a few months left for the campaign. So would that be a risk at all, do you think? 
No, I would not say that because uh, for for the coming weeks, he's doing a bit of both on the with the difficulty to departure the the future candidate. He's not candidate yet from the from the president of the country holding the presidency of the of the council of the EU, but. Well, we, we, we already have one month of, of presidency, so we can make some first preliminary uh, observation. And what strikes me is that um, the timing plays a bit against Macron, not because he would be too busy uh, with, with EU affairs, but because uh, the time, press, the media, the TV can devote to politics and to Macron is limited. It's... 20 minutes out of a 30 minutes journal, for instance, TV journal. And when we have started to talk about uh, a new issue related to radical left, a controversies on the COVID and the way the minister deal with it, well, at the end, they have a little time for, for EU affairs. And we've seen several informal councils, for instance, in January, that have been hardly mentioned within, within national press. So that was, as I said, the strategy of, of, of playing the EU for domestic political purpose, which is, uh, as we say in French, the bonne guerre, so, uh, which, is, uh, which makes sense uh, that, that they use this card. But I suspect it will not play that much. It will not be that successful because uh, the media just does not have time to, to talk about EU issues now that are by the focus on, on elections. Well, thank you. That's uh, we. Of course, we will have all reasons to come back also to following the French the political development, as it is really important for the EU as a whole. Now, turning a little bit again to the role of the presidency, I want to uh, turn to you, Auster. You talk quite a lot about this, you know, dealing, managing the unexpected, and how the presidency plays a role. How does one prepare for that, and what would be your sort of advice? for making a presidency successful in dealing with the unexpected? In fact, probably preparing for, for unexpected events, it's almost impossible. Otherwise, they will not be so, so much unexpected. Um, but basically, again, as I mentioned, uh, it's not the first time that the EU is, is facing some crisis. And, and there have been a few presidencies which have been dealing with crisis and we've seen what are the, the methods. Most likely, uh, first of all, uh, once again, flexibility is, is really important. Um, so for the presidency to be able to shift, for, uh, shift from own priorities to something that is emerging, actually. And for that, what is extremely important is once again to have administrative resources and to be able to shift some administrative resources from some topics to the other. Um, overall, um, in addition to that, uh, probably is just to be just to observe the situation, not to not to neglect certain issues, because of course they do not come up uh, in in one day. They 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 mount bit by bit, and so probably the the good presidency so should be able to to a certain extent to sacrifice even some some own priorities to be this honest broker. Uh, this 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 what uh, what may um, lead to success in managing the crisis in particular. It does not mean that that the presidency needs to necessarily really give up everything, but but just to be able to shift uh, some of the resources, some of the some of the attention to emerging topics is something what what probably each um, upcoming presidency should be prepared for. Mm. I would also like to, we talked about the relations and Eva, for instance, she also mentioned the importance of the presidency as being sort of the institutional representative of the council. And uh, you talk also about the importance of the relationship to the European Commission, for instance. Again, on about Mitbor, how, how should uh, a presidency prepare to be successful managing all of these relations uh, in your view? Indeed. Um... It is quite important, I think, when when the when the when the member state is, is is preparing for the for the presidency semester, to actually look at the commission work program, commission's work program, to look at what are the the priorities put forward by the commission, and in fact. Um, try to align them, because this is um, what I also uh, mentioned during my presentation. The commission really tends to put forward the proposals when there is this alignment between the priorities of the commission and of the presidency. So when there is actually um, 
uh, a chance that the legislation can be adopted or at least a good progress could, could be made on, on that specific dossier. So in this regard, the, the, the presidency really should, should take into account the, the, the work program, the priorities of the commission itself. Mm -hmm. Now, I have one question that I think I, at least I will pose to you, Alster, and also to Eva, if at all it's possible to answer. What should the presidency really avoid? What is the FUPA? What should one not do when holding the presidency? What do you say, Alster? <laughs> um, most likely, um, what the presidency should avoid is overall um, the focus on on its priorities alone. So because indeed this dissertating president's semester is often seen as an opportunity once in a decade, even more than a decade. And actually every member state uh, wants to somehow um, to, to, to show the country to Europe. Uh, um, however, I think it's extremely important to, to find this balance uh, between um, those general um, EU, EU priorities and those priorities of the member state in particular Mm -hmm. And and to try to, um, to 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 try to find a compromise also during the negotiations and and uh, just to see a bigger picture, so to say. I that that would be my view. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, how about you, Eva? You've you've seen this, of course, from the inside over a number of decades and thought about these matters a lot. I totally agree. I think uh, this is something that that has to be avoided because people will remember. I mean, to, to pick a very specific national point um, and, and try to solve it at others' expense, this will not be forgotten easily. Mm. So this is something that one every presidency, of course, should, should avoid. So I, I totally agree with you. Um, another thing is, is, of course, if there is a crisis, I think, um, uh, which might feel a bit unfortunate, of course, but I think the judgment of a presidency afterwards will be solely on how did they manage that crisis, sort of. If there's not really a, a huge crisis, then we all know what will judge the presidency. I mean, is it, uh, is it easy to follow? I mean, the mechanics of it, and is, is one really an honest broker? How many files have you uh, managed to conclude and all this? So, so and then there's, a, but if there's a crisis, I think this is what would be the sort of the judge of the, of the presidency's success afterwards. I just, Johan, perhaps wanted to add something, I mean, on, on the elections in Sweden, talking about the, the political uh, situation with, with our elections. Because normally, as well, we in Sweden know, it, it, it's um, uh, to form a government traditionally is, is a, a quick fix in Sweden. <laughs> but now we are turning a bit more European. So it um, uh, seems like it takes some time. Um, we don't know, of course, uh, the results of the elections in September, but we know that there might take some time. Uh, we cannot rule it out, of course. Uh, so what will then happen? <laughs> then we will have a transitional government that, of course, will have the responsibility to um, prepare the presidency. Uh, and a transitional government would then have to prepare the presidency priorities in very close collaboration, of course, with the other parties in the Swedish Riksdag. Mm. And, and, and this is something, of course, that we are thinking about from the civil service side, that we might end up in a situation where we have either a transitional government entering the presidency, well, hope not, uh, but then we can have new ministers, irrespectively, irrespective of the color of the government, but new ministers with new portfolios that in a very short time will have to be prepared for the presidency. So this is also something that we are uh, working on, how, how to deal with efficiently. Just a few comments on that. Thanks. Yes, indeed. We're turning, Sweden is turning more European, according to your analysis. And I, and I know that there have been member states where there have been caretaker governments also during the presidency period. Last time around, it took 134 days to form a government. So let's see where we are uh, once we get there towards the end of this year. Now, unfortunately, I have I have a dozen of questions still to address, but time flies. And uh, now it's the moment to conclude this seminar. So we have to take uh, remaining questions in the post seminar. Uh, I'm going to now hand out a big thank you to Ambassador de Gonville, Olivier Rosenberg, Alste Vasninote, and Eva Sjögren for your excellent contributions. 
before we close, uh, I'd like to point to any one of you who would be interesting is that in two weeks time, our next seminar will deal with the trialogue, which is something that we talked about today, the informal uh, decision making process in the European Union. So stay tuned for information on that. And please do check out the publications that we talked about today, accessible at CF's uh, website. So with that said, I wish you a really pleasant Wednesday. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.